Midwest and you jump on TikTok, or you go on vacation to like the West Coast, the cool bastards and you look at the people and they're wearing like cool things like things that you didn't know were cool but then you look at yourself and they've got styles that you that you thought people made fun of and then you're out there with some like basic shorts adidas shoes and some v-necks because you thought v-necks were still in and apparently they're not in anymore so you go back home you try to dress like them and then you realize that the west coast designs are about five years away from ever making their way into the midwest styling okay like we're the last to look cool almost every single time and when I mean that, I mean always. In the automotive industry, there's a segment that is filled with the cool kids. A little bit of that feeling. I'm Alex. Alex at a fine Instagram. And today we're going to be talking about those cool kids. The boys and girls that decided that absolutely not. I'm not going to keep my tires in one piece. And absolutely not. I don't want to keep my body of my car the same color. I want it to rub up against other cars for decades. And absolutely not do I want to have a reliable, low-cost vehicle. Ladies and gentlemen, let's talk about the history of one of the flashiest, one of the loudest, and probably the most misunderstood automotive sports out there in the industry. Let's dive into the history of drifting. Hola, me amo Dora. I think she says it nicer than that. And if you're looking for a place to see what wheels, tires, and suspension fit your newly acquired car or otherwise, potentially even, dare I say, a drift car, well then, bud, why don't you just go over and hit us up over at FitmentIndustries.com, where we have a large gallery, like over 40,000 vehicles. You can enter in your year, make, and model. It tells you what fits, so you can pick up wheels, tires, and suspension that come mounted, balanced, and shipped for free to your door, to the lower 48, all right? Sorry, Alaska and Hawaii. Maybe you should be more connected to the country. And in addition to that, of course, because some people like the stretchy boys, and some people like rubber bands, we can actually mount those things to your, to your wheels instead of getting judged and having the anxiety of going to a tire shop and them looking at you like you're an idiot. You don't have to do that because we don't judge you, mostly because we don't see you, but it's besides the point. Also, drop in the comments where you first heard of drifting. Was it fast and the furious? Maybe a little night YouTube adventure filled with funk music or something like that. The first time, maybe you put lunch trays under your rear wheels when you were in high school because that's what Sean and I did when we went to North or Chippewa. And let us know in the comments so we can read through all of them and laugh or cry. The history of drifting takes us across the water to the island of Japan, Kunimitsu Takahashi and a well-known motorcyclist that was one of the first Japanese racers to win a motorcycle Grand Prix in Germany all the way back in 1961. After a substantial accident on the Isle of Man TT, which if you guys don't know what that is, it looks a bit like this. And it f***ing is scary, okay? I hope it scares you as much as it scares me turning off the lights before going like up the stairs from the basement because I get nervous. The monster in evolution is what I used to think about. But after the crash, Takahashi would change courses and move to automobile racing. And I would too, considering the danger. In 1965, instead of being on two wheels, he began being on four on a Nissan Skyline. And in 1965, he would immediately just start taking wins. Not because of the Skyline and not really because of the money, but because of how he bombed through corners, a very specific technique that really originated with him. You see, back then, bias place racing tires were extremely tough to manage grip at high speeds when the rubber was twisted through a turn. It just didn't do well at dispersing the traction. So instead of trying to race normally, Takahashi would intentionally cause the car to slide with oversteer control before the apex of a corner, essentially trying to straighten out the car post-turn before the turn. Then the moment he exited that turn, he would be holding a speed higher than much of his competitors and just pretty much slam it down in hopes that he could get the traction on the later end of the turn. This unique driving ability wasn't anything too new, but Takahashi's ability to do so with such eloquence, okay? Okay. Word of the day is eloquence, and in a multitude of different weather conditions was what made him so special. Takahashi would never actually slow down depending on the weather, he just bombed through everything. And this is where people mention that drifting on street roads started before racing, because that's really not the case. And Takahashi's impressive driving behavior is essentially what captivated both the professional enthusiast that was getting their ass beat, and the 16 year old with the shit box that spent his weekends on the mountain roads of Japan. And to further compound that, Takahashi would race pretty much every everything. He'd go into race Formula One, GT2, he'd even race motorcycles and more. So when he began to like apply this technique and people saw success with it, it immediately followed soup and pretty much everywhere. That's 
kind of sort of where the illegal bit comes in. That's illegal. You can't do that on street roads. That's dangerous. I hate when people tell me that. It says, like, I know that. Like, I'm just out here booling around in the countryside. If I hurt myself, it's just me. Dangerous is our middle name, Karen. All right, we don't even know what that word means because we're young and bounce back like a wiggler. It's a toy from the 90s. If you guys were wondering, it's what you put your finger in and it's got the gel on the outside. It's plastic. It's called a wiggler. So as Takahashi began to establish the name of like the grandfather of professional drifting, this essentially laid the framework for a lot of people to also copy his craft, especially illegal street racers. And this is where the most popular name, probably the one that you know and love, the DK Drift King, Keishi Tushia, began to grow his technique because he did kinda sort of the same thing, but through the mountain roads in a classic, in a beautiful, in a panda looking 1986 Toyota Sprinter Chuenio. What is what is DK stand for? I'm gonna say it again. Donkey Kong. Drift King, okay? And that was it. I mean, essentially, this is how that style and that heritage began to get passing down. The illegal racing grew massive popularity in the 70s, specifically in Japan, and Tushia behind the wheel of setting records both on the track and off the track, the community just fell in love with the craft of drifting. Tushia would enter into professional professional racing in 1977 through the Fuji Freshman Race. He'd essentially dominate and then take that very same car and still illegally race on the midnight roads back in Japan because it was fun. It was so much fun that he got in trouble because of it. Fun fact, he was actually suspended for a period of time for illegally racing on the mountain roads and getting in trouble because of a short film where his illegal, you know, mountain racing was promoted. Like, turns out, People didn't like that, specifically the people that were helping him, you know, support his legal racing. Who knew? The public stunt was a little bit like top secret speeding ticket though. Bad on the short term, massive on the long term. This decision made headlines in the automotive industry, which led to more people to flock to the sport and essentially start doing and loving the idea of Smokey Boy Drifties, okay? And the interest in the sport just continued to rise. The need of having drivers come together and have an event and do all of it in some sort of sanctioned way started to really grow along with. With it. Events like the video option, Carboy, and more began to grow, and with it, the first official D1 Grand Prix for drifting would be hosted in the early 2000s, the late 1990s, officially cementing the activity into a fully fledged automotive sport. Now, the D1 event took place in 2001, but there are a couple events in between that. The D1 Grand Prix was co founded with the help of Chushia and Dahito Inada, okay? And he was the founder of the Tokyo Auto Saloon, which is an awesome modified event in Japan, which is like SEMA except better in every way because all it is is about crazy, just loud, obnoxious vehicles. The moment that this started to officially start taking roots in Japan, though, the interest spread to the United States of America, all right? A Willow Springs Raceway in California would be one of the first places a lot of people in the USA would start to see this activity. While it was hosted by Dajito Inada, one of the founders of the Grand Prix, it quickly evolved into its own style and community. This is essentially where the Japanese and the American drifting started coming together. Young bucks like Rise Millen and Brian Norris were the first to enter the sport before it was well received as much as it is today and in no time formula d would be founded in the states and z drift series in new zealand nordic drifting in europe and even the wing growing masters red bull drifting championship would start to take hold as we went into the 2000s it really started to spread like wildfire in 2003 formula d would take the official reins all right as the drifting series here in the 50 states co-founded by jim lea and ryan sage i'm sorry if i say that wrong as a sister company to an old company called slip Slipstream. Now, Slipstream was the same company that introduced the D1 Grand Prix to the States as well, essentially kind of tying those two pieces together, where Slipstream was the channel between Japan and the United States. Formula D now owns and operates the official drifting series in North America and is in its 18th year of competition, which is just absolutely nuts. Because of the varying degree of classes, professions, and seriousness of the sport, nearly anyone can get involved in drifting if they truly want to. What really matters is just it, 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 if you got like the Money because it's a very expensive sport, okay? Whether you're just jumping into the sport with a stock 350Z with an LSD, Artisa Elders, and Nankang NS25s, or you wanna ramp up, you wanna get yourself a Boss 240SX also on Artisa Elders. Meh. We sponsored one, so that's why I keep bringing it up. You should take a look. I'm sure we'll put a picture here. 
I'm so excited to see it. But seriously, no matter where you're at, whether it's official judging or just some sort of fun circle track, it's all possible with pretty much anything that's rear wheel drive. The art and craft of drifting has multiple routes. It has different ways of actually conducting the drifting, whether it's a clutch kick or Kansei drifting. You can have a ship box or you can have a $100,000 monster. It really doesn't matter, at least if you're really trying to jump into it. What matters is going in, learning everything you can, making some mistakes, crashing every once in a while, meeting people and having fun. We definitely recommend some cheap tires too. But what do you think about drifting? Is it something that should stay around for a while or is it just one of those hot boy things? Let us know below and if you're going for aftermarket wheels, tires or suspension for your drift car or your daily, be sure to hit us up over at fitmentindustries.com. If you'd like us to touch on anything more in the drifting world or another segment of the automotive scene at all, let us know below. I'm Alex from Fitment Industries and we will see you later. Peace. Ow, my knee. Soccer. Ow.